Well, uh, once again, welcome to Bell Shoals. My name is Corey Abney and I serve as the lead pastor. And uh, this is a special day because uh, we are welcoming all of our campuses uh, right now as we uh, worship together open God's word together across all of Bell Shoals. So I wanna welcome those of you who are worshiping with us in Riverview and Apollo Beach. Uh, we are so grateful for how the Lord is at work uh, at all of our campuses and all of our locations. Of course, I wanna welcome those of you who are online today, uh, watching and worshiping with us from all around the country and even places around the world. Uh, we believe that God's doing a great work here at Bell Shoals and we're so honored to have everyone uh, connecting with us today as a part of of it, and uh, we are a church family that has what we call hills we die on, some core values that are very, very important to us uh, across all of our campuses that really uh, are established pillars for us in terms of why we do what we do, things like aggressive authenticity. Uh, we believe that God is gracious and merciful to meet us where we are, and and to use us in terms of how he has made us. And um, you may have noticed that some of us are a little unique. Everyone's a little bit different, but uh, we come into this place every week and we serve King Jesus in our community every single week uh, in a manner that's consistent with the gifts and the talents that we have. And uh, if you're new to Bell Shoals, I want you to know you can be who you are here. We believe in aggressive authenticity. We're also community-minded. Uh, we do so much in West Central Florida because we believe that God has called us to be a blessing to our community. And so we do a lot of things all throughout the week, every single week, uh, to be a blessing to our community. We do things like our Easter family fun night coming up here in just a few weeks uh, because we want to be a blessing to our community. And we reach uh, thousands of people each year through our Easter uh, services and through our Easter family fun night. This year, you just heard we have 50,000 <laughs> eggs that will be here. Uh, just a few years ago, I think we started with 10 or 15,000 and then we bumped it up every year. And this year we have 50,000 eggs and our goal is for those eggs to last two minutes. Uh, that is our goal. So um, we're gonna have just uh, a lot of fun and, and we're inviting our community to be here. We're a, a church family that values and uh, it wants to be a blessing to our community. Uh, we're also uh, a church family that believes in bold moves. That's the third hill on which we die. We believe that serving Jesus is the greatest privilege in the world. And so we do a lot of bold things around here like uh, starting and supporting campuses here in West Central Florida. We launch and support missionaries all around the world. We support church planning efforts all across the country. Uh, we do some bold things in our community every single week in terms of engaging our community, our schools, and uh, the opportunities that God gives to us. And so uh, we're gonna continue to make bold moves in the days to come. We value a fourth unwavering unity. We've actually talked about that in our Philippians series that God works through a united people and Bell Shoals is united across all of our campuses. Uh, we're seeing God working in a remarkable way and so we value unwavering unity. We, we know that if God is gonna work in a profound way, it's gonna come through the united efforts of all of Bell Shoals, and uh, we're so excited about that. Uh, we also value fifth, something we call relatable truth. Uh, I want you to know, again, if you're new to Bell Shoals today, that uh, we value God's word as the primary foundational uh, guide for our lives. And uh, every single week we gather here, we do so around the word of God. We, we engage in a Bible study here every single week because we believe that God's word and God's will is best for us. That's what we need. And uh, so we do our very best across all of our campuses to offer uh, the truth of God's word and not our opinions. And uh, we try to do that in a relatable way. And then finally, we, we value fearless generosity. I've said this before, it's worth saying again, that, that I believe since 1961, God's had his hand of favor on Bell Shoals in part because from our very beginning, we have made it our goal to be a blessing to the world. And that happens every single week here at Bell Shoals through fearless generosity. A generosity in terms of our financial giving, generosity in terms of our time, our energy, sacrificing uh, vacation days to go on mission trips, 
Man, we, we have so many ways that we employ fearless generosity. And, and today, as we wrap up Philippians and also kind of launch into a new series here across all of our campuses, we're, we're gonna discover kind of a fresh and a new what it looks like to live a life of fearless generosity because this is something that God has used and blessed across his church for 2,000 years. Certainly been true of Bell Shoals. Again, it's one of the reasons I think God's hand of blessing has been on our faith family because we've made it our goal through fearless generosity to be a blessing to, to people everywhere. And, um, and, and, and that is absolutely what we're gonna continue to do. And we're gonna see that in Philippians today. As we wrap up this series, we've been in for a few weeks here, this Bible study on Philippians, we're, we're walking verse by verse through this incredible letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippian church. Philippi was a Roman city located in Greece and Paul planted a church there during one of his missionary journeys. And, and this church, okay, literally from day one proved to be one of the strongest avenues of support for the Apostle Paul throughout the course of his life. Man, they were fearlessly generous to Paul. They supported him on his journeys. They supported him in his times of need. Multiple times they, they gathered offerings together even when it was hard for them to do so so that Paul's ministry could continue. And here in the context of Paul's letter to Philippi, we know that he's in Rome, he's in prison, he's under house arrest, he's there for a couple of years. And, and, and these Philippian believers are so concerned about him that they send a man named Epaphroditus to him with some money to help sustain him, with some other gifts and goods that would encourage him. And Paul, as we've seen, has just been overwhelmed by their kindness and generosity. At the very end of the letter, he's gonna thank them one more time for their generosity, and he's gonna just offer some encouragement about what it means to be a fearlessly generous people. And that's such a needed word for us because... We don't naturally give fearlessly or generously. <laughs> like that's just not our default. Like I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I just had this experience again recently where um, I was buying something from a store and the total was like $11.98. All right, has this ever happened to you? And then you're asked, I was asked, would you like to round up for charity? And I don't mean to brag, I don't mean to present myself as the hero today. But I said, yes, I would. And that two cents went to charity. And again, I hesitate to say this because I don't wanna make myself a hero, okay? But literally, over the course of my life, I have donated hundreds of cents to charity in that way. It's pretty amazing, right? And, and, and if you're like me, you're like, okay, if it's $11.02, no way. No, I don't wanna donate. No. But like if we're in the upper 80s, 90s, after the dot, you know what I'm saying? Okay, go ahead, you can have it. And I feel good about that, don't you? I feel good about that. I normally go home and tell my wife, honey, you would not believe the contribution I made today. And she's like, honey, do I need to add this as a category in our budget? Uh, probably not. No, I don't, um, I don't think we're gonna miss that. And that is reflective <laughs> of how most Americans approach giving and generosity. Uh, it's a principle I saw this recently called the 3S principle, okay? And, and there's a difference between a 3S giver and a 3P giver, okay? Let me, let me show this to you. Uh, a 3S giver, okay, is a giver who, who gives sporadically, spontaneously, and sparingly. That is me in the drive through line at Duncan, all right? It's sporadic, it's not regular, it's spontaneous, and it's sparing, right? It's, it's not something that is on my mind regularly. And, and probably if we had like a category of how most Americans give, it would be like a 3S giver. It's spontaneous, it's sporadic, and it's sparing. What we're gonna see here with the Philippians, and, and this is remarkable, again, we've seen it from their very beginning, 
is that they're not three S givers, they're what we would call three P givers. Okay, let me show you what a three P giver is. It's someone whose giving is planned, it's prioritized, and it's progressive. Now, this is what Paul's gonna talk to us about today because this was so on his heart relative to the Philippians' posture toward him. They were three P givers, right? It was planned. Like they had a strategy. They, they, they gave with intentionality. It wasn't just I spur the moment. I saw this video or I heard about this need and, and, and I just wanted to throw in a little bit to help out. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that type of giving, but, but as we're gonna see today, that should not be our primary avenue of giving. No, it should be planned, right? It's, it's intentional and then it's prioritized. Like it's a priority to us. We're gonna talk about that over the next couple of weeks of what it means that our giving should be out of the first fruits of the harvest, okay? That's a theme that runs through the Bible. And then it's progressive. It's something that over time we increase, something over time we continue. And, and if we could just summarize the Philippians' relationship with Paul, it would be on a 3P kind of level. Certainly they prayed for him, they encouraged him, but then they also supported him. And they were coming alongside of him in his ministry and the ministry of others, and they were giving very, very generously in multiple ways. And here as we come to the end of the letter, we're gonna see the fruit of that in Paul's life and ministry and how he affirms that in a way that goes way beyond anything financial or temporal. Now, I, I know across all of our campuses today, some of you are here for the very first time and at your very first visit at Bell Shoals, the pastor is talking about giving. And so if you haven't left yet, let me just say, this is literally the first time I have talked about giving in a couple of years. You say, well, why are you doing it on the very first day I'm visiting Bell Shoals? Because we believe in relatable truth and we believe in teaching through the Bible. And as we've been teaching through this letter known as Philippians, we're literally coming to the end of the letter and the end of the letter is about giving. So today I'm gonna teach on giving. In other words, I didn't just like wake up this morning and think today would be a good day to talk about giving. Let me offend all of our first time guests today, <laughs> right? That's not the strategy. Actually, if you're new to the Bible, you're new to Christianity, it may surprise you how much the Bible talks about giving. Do you know why? Because Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And what we see with Paul today as we come to the end of Philippians is that he's most concerned not about the gifts, but about how God richly blesses and provides for the givers and how through giving, we experience something powerful in our relationship with God because through giving and generosity, our hearts are tethered more to God and they're more dependent upon him. And, and, and so let me give you a key takeaway. If you're taking notes, getting across all of our campuses today, let me encourage you just to write this down, right? In the margin of your Bible or in your iPad or on your phone, um, you know, whatever you're using today in terms of having God's word in front of you, just make a note of this, okay? The greatest blessing in life is to be a blessing to others. Man, that's so true. Like the greatest blessing in life is to be a blessing to others. And it's one thing to receive blessings and the blessing of someone's friendship or someone's generosity, or someone's kindness to you in a time of need. But I tell you, man, the greatest blessings in life are always related to when God uses you to be a blessing to others. Man, that just brings such a joy and a fulfillment that's hard to describe in words. And and, and what we see with the Philippians, one of the reasons they were such a special group of people to the Apostle Paul is that they were increasingly generous over the course of his ministry, even when it was difficult for them to be so. And, and they just had such a heart driven by being a blessing to others. And they, they were so driven by being a blessing to Paul. They so loved him and cared for him. And when they heard about his imprisonment in Rome, immediately they gather up some money, some dollars, some gifts, some, some supplies, and they send Epaphroditus on a very, very, very long, difficult journey to get to Paul in Rome be, because they're like, man, we gotta come alongside of him. And they were just so set on being a blessing to others that that's literally 
what characterized their fellowship. That's why Paul says at the very, very beginning of the letter, if you remember, I thank my God upon my every remembrance of you. It's been such a blessing to me, right? And this is the theme that's come through our study of Philippians, that being a blessing to others is really the greatest blessing we experience in life. And this is something that Paul talked about in other places where he planted churches. For example, let me just take you quickly before we go to Philippians to, to Acts 20. This is Paul now speaking to the church in Ephesus, to the elders in Ephesus as he was boarding a ship to go back to Jerusalem. Okay, this is like some of the last words he spoke to these leaders in the church. And here's what he says. In every way, I've shown you that it's necessary to help the weak by laboring like this and remember the words of the Lord Jesus because he said, Jesus said this, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And Paul's encouraging the Ephesian elders, hey, you guys keep on serving those in need. You keep on being a blessing to your community and you keep on giving. Remember what Jesus said. It's, it's more blessed to give than receive. And, and one of the reasons the church is the church is because we are the primary conduit to the world of communicating the grace, kindness, and generosity of God. And we do that through our giving. We do that through our missionary support. We do that through our church planning strategy. We do that through our local campuses, just every week that we give, every week that we serve, every week that we offer up our dollars and our talents and our time, right? Like we are advancing the grace and the kindness of God. And listen, if you're joining into that movement with us here at Bell Shoals, then you know what it means to experience the blessing that is the greatest blessing you'll ever experience. God using you to be a blessing to others. And you know what? One of the cool things I think of the new heavens and new earth is gonna be just experiencing firsthand how God has used your giving and your serving right here on this earth. Because you know what's happening right now through your giving and through your serving and through your missionary engagement and through your uh, going on a mission trip or serving in the Hope House or whatever the case may be. You, you know what's really, really cool? You're impacting more people's lives right now than you know about. And one day, I think we're gonna have a fuller sense of how God has used all of this. And that's just gonna be awesome to discover what it looks like now for God to use you to be a blessing to others. You see, Paul's like, remember, this, this is the goal. This is why the church exists. And so as we come to the very end of Philippians, I want you to see Paul talking not just about, right, like the physical, but the spiritual. And, uh, and he starts in this very last section talking about contentment, all right? And uh, so let's go to Philippians chapter four, pick it up in verse 10. And, uh, and then let me give you our, our, our kind of first takeaway for today, all right? Here, here's what, Here's what Paul says. Let's look at this at all of our campuses today. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again, you have renewed your care for me. See, there it is. Paul's talking about, man, you, you've been so faithful to meet my needs and to come alongside of me for years now. He says, you were in fact concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. And I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. Now, just look at that quickly. Look, Paul's like basically like, you've come alongside of me, you've given, you've supported me, man, you've been such a blessing to me. And then he kind of says, I think this is kind of weird, like, like it's super cool, but it's like, he's like, um, by the way, I don't need any of this. Isn't that kind of like a weird thank you note? Like, just think about this, like, right, like you're working through the store and you're picking up a thank you note because somebody's come alongside of you in a time of need and, and they've been a tremendous blessing to you and you pick out the thank you note and it's got flowers and glitter on the outside because flowers and glitter are always the best cards, right, ladies? Okay, right, guys? <laughs> okay, that was a trick question. Okay, so you get this nice card, it says thank you and then you open it up on the inside, it says I didn't really need what you gave me, but hey, I appreciate it. <laughs> like in essence, that's what Paul is saying, but he doesn't mean it, of course, flippant. Like he's gen like genuinely moved by their support. But he's trying to teach them something here that's on a deeper level. He's like, listen, I, and this is what he says, I, I, 
I'm just so moved and appreciative of the fact that you were concerned about me and you've revived that concern and you've sent Epaphroditus and you've given me some dollars to you know, buy groceries and you've given me some supplies that I need as I'm imprisoned here. But I want you to know, Philippi, I'm okay. I, I don't need, I'm, I'm grateful for it and I'm gonna use it, it's gonna help, but I don't like need it for sustained joy in my life. Because let me paraphrase what's coming. Paul's gonna say, because my joy is drawn from a deeper well than anything in terms of American currency or Roman currency or Band-Aids or supplies or Thin Mints, which could have been in that basket Epaphroditus took the Apostle Paul. He's like, I appreciate all this. It's helpful. It's encouraging to me, but I want you to understand. I don't like need it to live a life of joy. I'm okay. Because he says this, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. I mean, that's such a good word. Hey, can I just remind you today that um, the truly wealthy person is the person who is content in Christ. If you are content with who you are and what you have, then you are wealthy. It doesn't matter if you make a trillion dollars a year or $10 a year, if you're content with what you have and who you have in Christ, you're wealthy. Because I've been around a lot of wealthy people over the years who are not content, and I've been around non-wealthy people who are. I've been to third world countries and seen people with less than you can ever imagine who are happier than some of us who have more than we know what to do with. Contentment doesn't have anything to do with a dollar amount or a net worth. And if you're truly content with what you have and you're truly content with who you are in Christ, then you are wealthy because you don't need anything else to move the joy needle in your life. That is true wealth. Paul's like, I'm there, right? What he's teaching us is is that true contentment in Christ is tethered to the gospel in this respect, that in Christ, all of us are wealthy because in Christ, we have an inheritance that is beyond belief. You, you are wealthy in Christ. You have more than you could ever possibly imagine. You are loved more than you could possibly imagine. You have a future that is better than anything you could ever imagine. And no matter how much or how little you have in this life, Paul's like, it's kind of like monopoly money. It's gonna do good for you right now in buying some houses and hotels. But at some point in time, Jesus is gonna return and he's gonna wipe all that off the game board and he's gonna establish a new heavens and a new earth. And guess what? In the new heavens and a new earth as a child of the king, you are gonna be better taken care of than you can ever imagine, right? You you are wealthy in Christ. You have more than you could ever imagine. You're loved more than you could ever imagine. And Paul's like, I've discovered that secret. Like whether I'm in chains or I'm free, whether I have more than I can spend or I don't have very much at all, like I have learned the secret of being content. Like I so appreciate your giving. I so appreciate your support. I so appreciate your love and your kindness. But I just want you to know, he's like, I'm okay. Because in Christ, I know what it means, whether famine or fortune, to be content. And can I just tell you this? Listen, this is important, okay? I believe one of the most misused and abused verses of the Bible is Philippians 4.13. And I have claimed this verse as a Cincinnati Bengals fan. (laughs) We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And for 48 years consecutive of my life, that verse has not proven true. I remember Evander Holyfield 
when he fought Mike Tyson, had Philippians 4.13 on his robe as he marched into the ring. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he whooped Mike Tyson that day and we're like, Philippians 4.13, baby, all day. And so he had a similar robe made, I think, for his defense, maybe Lennox Lewis, something like that, in uh, Philippians 4.13, you know it's gonna work, right? And he lost. Maybe he won, because I don't think anybody ate his ear that day, but he, he still lost the fight. It's like, wait a minute, what happened to Philippians 4.13? Listen to me, if you're new to the Bible, you're new to church, maybe you've been around a while and you've got Philippians 4.13 all over your house. Like I can, Philippians 4.13 has nothing to do with you getting what you want. You winning a fight, your team winning a game, you making straight A's, you being first chair in the orchestra. Don't be quoting Philippians 4.13. You know what Philippians 4.13 is about in its context? That no matter what situation you're in, you can find joy in Christ because through him and the richness of his grace and forgiveness and the hope of his heaven and the glory of the blessings that he will bestow on you, no matter how good or bad your situation is, you can live with joy because you can do it through Christ that gives you strength. Right? Like that's what Philippians 4.13 is all about. So don't be quoting Philippians 4.13 out of context. Some people are like, this is a promise of wealth. Philippians 4.13, God wants me to be wealthy. That is literally the exact opposite of what Paul is saying. Paul's like, I'm not wealthy. I'm under house arrest, like I'm falsely accused and charged. I'm limited in my ministry in terms of where I can go, but God is using it and God is blessing it and I am content because I can do it through Christ who gives me strength. He literally is saying the exact opposite of what most people say. And this is powerful when you discover it for yourself. Do you realize that contentment fuels generosity? When you're truly content in Christ, you don't see your stuff the same. It's just stuff. And you know what most people think today about contentment? They think, if I just had fill in the blank, I would be content. And some of us walked in the room today with something. It's health related, not even bad things, by the way. It's health related. If God would just heal me, I would be content. It's job related, it's money related, it's relationship related, something with your children or your grandchildren. You walked into the room today at one of our campuses and you're like, you know what, God, if you would just do this, I would be happy. If you would just do this, I would be content. And I have a good word for you today, no. No matter what your temporal circumstances are like through Christ, who gives you strength, you can find joy and contentment in him. And I'm mindful here of a, of a man that Peter and John encountered on the way to worship at the temple in Acts 3. Remember, it was a man who was lame from birth. He was laying in front of the temple gates, unable to walk. He had to beg for a living. And I'll, Do you remember that this is, I think, one of the most, like, I find it humorous, historical encounters in the Bible, okay, it's not presented as humor, but it's kind of funny because, because this guy, he can't, he can't walk, he can't use his legs. He was viewed not just physically like down and crippled, but like spiritually, you know, people view this as a judgment of God on his life. And Peter and John walk by and, and Peter looks at him and, and he says, hey, look up at me. And the guy's like, oh man, no one's ever asked me to look him in the eye before. And the dude's like excited, right? Like, oh my goodness, yeah. And Peter says to him, this is what I find so funny. He says, hey man, silver or gold, I don't have to give to you. <laughs> uh, that's kind of what I need, bro. Like, then what do you have? <laughs> like, um, literally, I have people that carry me here to this mat every single day because I need silver and gold because you see my legs here, they don't work, and I can't work, and I don't have any other way to provide for my food, and uh, if you ain't got no silver or gold, bro, like, I don't need one of your gospel tracks. And I just find this hysterical. I would love to know what was running through that man's mind. Peter's like, hey, man, look at me. He's like, Yes! 
How big is this check gonna be? Hey man, I ain't got no money to give you. <laughs> wah, 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 right? And Peter says, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk and he heals him. And before long, the dude's going in the temple for the first time in his life, literally doing the moonwalk, okay? <laughs> This is the man that gave us the moonwalk, not Michael Jackson, okay? I just want you to understand that, okay? This dude going in the temple, literally, he's le- the Bible said he's leaping, Jay praising God. Everybody's like, isn't that the guy that used to beg? Now listen, if you had asked him that, that morning what his greatest need is, he would have said, I would be content if I just had the use of my legs. But his greatest need was the forgiveness of his sins and the granting of eternal life in Christ. That is true wealth. And the man thought he just needed the use of his legs, but what he didn't understand is no, actually what he needed was a personal relationship with God through Jesus. And Peter says, by giving you strength in your legs, I'm gonna prove to you the power of Jesus to forgive sin. And the man got the use of his legs and he got forgiveness over his life, and so he's gonna be moonwalking all throughout the new heavens and the new earth. And some of you think if I just had the use of my legs, I would be content. If I just had a solution to my financial situation, if I just had a resolution to this broken relationship, if I just had X, Y, Z, I would be okay. And uh, listen, I'm here to remind you today what Paul's saying, no, through, through, the strength of Jesus and the blessing and richness of Jesus, actually what you need is a personal relationship with him. And if you have it, you need to grow in it and and truly understand the wealth and the blessing that you have in him. Because there's all kinds of people today who have the use of their legs who aren't yet content. None of these physical things will satisfy the deepest longing of your heart. Only Jesus will do that. And if you have Jesus, you have everything you need to be content and to have joy in every circumstance. Are you with me? This is what Paul's saying. I'm so grateful for your generosity, but I'm okay if I don't have it. That's why the author of Hebrews says this. I love this. He says, keep your life free from the love of money. Right, that's not gonna satisfy the deepest longing of your heart. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Like you've got everything you need in Christ, and when you tether your identity to him, then you can be joyful and content in every circumstance. Paul says true contentment brings joy in every circumstance. Okay, secondly, write this down. Giving to others is ultimately, okay, an offering to God. Listen, it's, our giving is never about just something on a human level, right? No, there's something deeper happening. It's a heart issue. Okay, so, so Paul says this, Philippians 4, go to verses um, 15 to 18 quickly. Look at this. He says, Paul does, and you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my needs several times. Do you see their ongoing pattern of generosity? And he says this, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. God blesses a cheerful giver. And I have received everything in full and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied having received from Epaphroditus all that you have provided. Now look at this, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Now this is super, super cool. Why should we have giving, 3P kind of giving, right? That's planned, prioritized, and progressive. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. He blesses a cheerful giver. Our giving actually is a profound demonstration of faith and trust. And and our giving marks a maturing moment in our lives. We say, okay, God, I'm gonna trust you with what is most tangible to me. So as God is faithful to you in that, you learn to trust him in all the other areas of your life as well. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Paul says to the Philippians, listen, I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, just, I'm not just here saying thanks for what you provided to me. I'm, I just want you to know all that you provided, God has blessed and received himself as an offering to him. Our giving has not just an earthly component, but an eternal component. 
which is why Proverbs 11.25 says this, a generous person will be enriched. I love this verse of scripture. And the one who gives a drink of water will receive water. Can I just give you a good word here? You can't outgive God's blessings in your life. Amen. You just can't do it. So Paul's like, hey, listen, here, here's what I want you to know. As he closes out the letter, true contentment is joy in every circumstance. We can do it through Christ who gives us strength. He says, then secondly, listen, remember that as you're giving through the ministry of the church and you're giving to others, it's ultimately an offering to God. Man, God blesses the cheerful giver. And then lastly, write this down. Generosity to others is just a reflection of God's generosity to us. Let me give you the last verse here of our study. He says, and my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Hey, I got news for you. No one on this planet is wealthier than God. Man, he owns it all. He's able to maneuver blessings into your life that defy human explanation. Did you hear me say that? He's able to move blessings into your life that defy human explanation. He will provide for you. He promises to provide, by the way, what you need. I love that because sometimes we need things we don't want and we want things we don't need. Thankfully, we have a heavenly father that knows what we need and he supplies what we need 100% of the time. He's never gonna leave you, never gonna forsake you. He's got blessings for you beyond anything you can comprehend. And so if you'll trust him now in what you have and learn what it looks like to walk by faith and live by faith and to treasure things of eternal value, not just temporal. How does that happen? Well, first of all, through our giving, right? This is what Paul's communicating to the Philippians, right? We do that and, and, and we, 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 we experience the blessing of God in a unique and profound way. And if you are connected to us today and you don't have a regular pattern of giving, I wanna challenge you with this spiritual truth. And I'm saying it to you in the same way Paul was saying it to the Philippians. For your benefit, for your walk with God, for your joy, for your contentment, for your growth. You're like, here's the pastor again talking about money. I could care less about the dollars. Let me tell you why, all right? We, we steward our dollars well here at Bell Shoals. We work on it every single week. But I wanna say this loud and proud in the Lord. God is gonna provide for the ministry of Bell Shoals. All right, he has for 63 years and he's gonna provide till the Lord returns. All right, we're doing fine. <laughs> I don't say any of this because of our need. I say it because of what Paul said to the Philippians that, 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 that our giving and our, our, our generosity, right? And our other's mindedness is what fuels God's blessing in our lives. That's why Paul says, I don't seek the gift. I seek, I, I seek the blessing of God for you in that. And over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna talk at all of our campuses about just God's math and how it's not our math and how we, when we prioritize this type of giving, God somehow miraculously lines up all the other things in our budget. And you say, Pastor, this doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, join the club. <laughs> yeah. I don't have an explanation for it other than what Paul said to the Philippians, that through Christ, we can do all things giving us contentment and joy. And this isn't just something that Paul said to the Philippians, right? This is something all throughout human history that's been um, communicated to us. And so let me wrap up with this beautiful Psalm that David gave us. Long before any of us were ever thinking about building budgets or long before Paul ever wrote to the Philippians, let me just close out our time together at all of our campuses with this verse of scripture. You ready? Check this out, Psalm 37. David said this talking about cattle and sheep and goats. How you like that? Like that was his budget. How many cattle do we have? Write that down. But he found God faithful to provide. He said, the little that the righteous person has is better than the abundance of many wicked people. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord supports the righteous. And the Lord watches over the blameless all of their days and their inheritance will last 
forever. And they will not be disgraced in times of adversity and they will be satisfied in days of hunger, but the wicked will perish. The Lord's enemies like the glory of the pastures will fade away and they will fade away like smoke. The wicked person borrows and does not repay, but the righteous one is gracious and giving. And those who are blessed by the Lord will inherit the land, but those cursed by him will be destroyed. For a person's steps are established by the Lord and he takes pleasure in his way. Though he falls, he will not be overwhelmed because the Lord supports him with his hand. I have been young and now I am old, but yet I have not seen the righteous abandoned or his children begging for bread because our father is always generous, always lending and his children are a, blessing. That is the confidence we have in our Father. Amen? That is the confidence we have. To give, right? To be generous, to serve, to because the Lord will always provide. And by tethering our hearts to Him in that way, we will experience a greater measure of God's blessing than ever before. And um, so I'd like to ask you just to bow with me at all of our campuses today and let's pray. And um, let's ask God to move in our hearts this week as we think about how we can be strategic and intentional. in being a blessing to our neighbors and the nations. And so Father, I do ask that you would um, just stir our hearts today to manage well what you've entrusted to us and uh, to, to cultivate the spirit of the Philippians in our own lives and families, to be a giving, generous people. God, to see what you give to us as just temporal in nature, not only to, to provide for our families and to be blessed through that provision, but God, to be a blessing to others, to give to you, to think about impacting others, not just here in West Central Florida, but all around the world. God, help us to cultivate this spirit of generosity and just to keep that going until you return. For I know, God, there are millions of people around us who need the gospel, billions around the world. And so through our collective giving and sacrifice, through our commitment, to support ministries here and around the world. God, we pray that you would bring people to salvation and that one day when we receive our inheritance, <laughs> God, we would see the impact of our faithfulness. For your glory and your renown, we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.